just by way of very brief introduction, really, uh, Rochelle is, as I said, the project architect for the competition winning residential development at Dairy Road, Canberra, Australia, part of a wider master plan for a landscape led mixed use site. As a continuation of the adjacent wetland ecosystem, the new residential area will regenerate an almost four hectare site. Her talk, Rochelle's talk, will offer behind the scenes insights on the project, which investigates new building technologies and will be the studio's first project to utilize rammed earth excavated from the site. In collaboration with the University of South, New South Wales, David Chipperfield Architects undertook extensive research to both bring deep nature deep into the site and develop technical processes for the rammed earth. So this is a particular interest um, to all of us, I think, particularly students. There are ever increasing numbers of student projects that speculate on the use of rammed earth particularly in an urban context. So to see um, this happening live and direct is just going to be uh, fascinating for us. Um, so thank you, Rochelle. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. And as I say, everybody, please do ask questions. We'll wrap up at about um, five to two so you can move on to other, other appointments and have a little time for questions after Rochelle's talk. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, Thank you, Samantha, and um, I think I'm speaking on behalf of uh, the uh, D DCA. We're really excited to be participating in these lectures, and um, it's great to be able to share kind of the process behind this project. Uh, so it's great. Uh, I'll share my screen, and we can uh, dive right in. Um, okay, and. You should see my screen. Uh, so before I dive into the topic, um, I want to um, kind of uh, just make a note about how we work and who's behind this project. And um, architecture is an, an inherently collaborative process and um, all the projects that we do in our, in our studio rely on interdisciplinary teams. Um, but this project in particular, the collaboration um, was even stronger. It's a landscape-led approach, which was developed in very close collaboration with Jane Owen and her team. Um, and the round earth that Samantha, you just mentioned, and all that research that's going on with the University of New South Wales is being um, led by uh, the engineers in Desco, who are based locally in Canberra and are kind of working across um, geographical distances and timeframes kind of um, developed this this uh, project, which is is quite interesting and it's worked working quite well, I would say. And then this is the we behind uh, the work I'll be showing you today. So um, this is a well, we started as a competition in 2021, and it's been ongoing since. So you can imagine um, all these people and the contribution we've we've been doing. It's really a collective effort. Um, okay, so Dairy Road is um, a precinct in the periphery of Canberra and it's surrounded by different neighbourhoods, um, residential, industrial. Um, it's also bound on the um, kind of southeast edge by um, a highway, um, but it's really kind of nestled in the fringes of the Jerobombra wetlands, which are highlighted here, uh, which is a nature reserve. And um, the site isn't part of the wetland. Um, it sits above the floodplain because of um, man-made earthworks. Um, but its relation to the wetland offers us a cue to kind of addressing this idea of urban development and how it can encroach or mitigate this kind of bottleneck that's kind of encroaching into the, into the wetland. Um, and this is an aerial view of the site. So Dayro is actually a wider uh, mixed use urban development that the client Malonglo um, is, is managing and overseeing and orchestrating. The residential master plan is that um, kind of red line to the south of the site and the entire site is going to be developed into 
um, industrial, the existing industrial sheds being uh, repurposed and uh, developed into artisanal and recreational spaces. So kind of was become this um, thriving um, neighborhood, um, kind of in this very quirky location in Canberra. And one thing I want to kind of draw your attention to in this photograph, you'll see that on the south of the residential zone, there's that kind of grassy, earthy mound of earth. And that's um, that's actually the um, excavation waste from the construction of the Parliament building and the National Gallery in Canberra. And I was just kind of dumped onto this site. Um, and it currently sits there. We, it's, we call it the spoil. So if I use that word, you know, I'm referring to this. So it's a spoil mound. Um, it's unconsolidated fill. So it's not suitable to build on. It would need to be removed before buildings are built because um, it's so unstable. And because the wetland is a nature reserve and because this is construction debris, it's considered a contaminant to, a hazardous contaminant to the wetland. So part of the project came with this challenge about what we're going to do with this poem and on how we're going to deal with it. It's obviously huge, it covers most of the site. So um, with the competition, the client set up these kind of three key ambitions. The first one was for residential development or neighborhood that gave importance to and provided shared public spaces and outdoor spaces. And that was an important character that um, uh, needed to be provided. And then this idea that um, we are providing for a diverse mix of households and people and the, these dwellings need to be affordable and, and healthy. And then this kind of shared commitment to simple and highly sustainable design. And from that, and like through conversations, we honed this kind of our own mission statement for the, for the project, which is that Day Road would be a neighborhood where landscape is protagonist and where buildings become a framework for living in nature. And this um, drawing is uh, by one of my colleagues. Um, we did very early on in the competition and we think it still stands true to the idea of the project and what we're trying to achieve. Um, and kind of this statement and these ideas about kind of what does it mean to make landscape protagonists, what, how do we shape these buildings we realized that there are really three aspects that we need to consider for this project. It's also kind of covering diverse scales from master plan to uh, individual apartment dwellings. And those three aspects are ecology, which has to do with understanding the wetland ecosystem and how we can kind of tap into that and build on it and enhance it. Um, the second one is about community. This is a residential neighborhood. It's part of a mixed use development. We need to put something in place that can um, support that and help it thrive. And the third one is about construction and uh, thinking about how that links in with these two other themes, but also these sustainable ambitions that we're trying to um, develop and, and, and put in place. So I'll talk about each uh, aspect a bit more abstractly and then we'll dive into the specifics of the project. But when we talk about ecology, um, we're thinking about this intensification of wetland and our site, even though it's not part of the nature reserve, should be kind of tapping into that. Um, the kind of the second layer is um, is landscape and planting and regenerating the soil and reintroducing um, native plants and thinking about this kind of continuous um, landscape that from the wetland kind of climbs up and and crosses our site and covers it really. Um, and then we start inserting buildings and thinking about what these buildings' relationship is to the landscape and. Um, they shouldn't be interrupting it, they should be sitting within it. And so I, well, we had lots of discussions about how do you keep this ground open and light and how can these buildings sit lightly on the ground, so to speak. Um, but also they start to create a microclimate. So this landscape that's crossing through the site, as you go from wetland um, more towards the center of the site, um, landscapes can start to change because of these microclimates and the buildings can actually carry uh, or support uh, landscape on it. So it really becomes a holistic 
thing. Um, and obviously that idea, that ambition, that outdoor public space is an amenity. So we're not just designing a, a landscape garden, we're thinking about how we can integrate um, recreational spaces into that continuous landscape, whether they're picnic areas or playgrounds or um, kitchen gardens and community gardens. And this um, image on the, this photograph is, a, is another project that we've done um, a few years ago, but it kind of had that kind of spirit that we wanted to um, explore and think about how we integrate buildings and landscape. So the, se the second aspect is community. And another thing that came out of the client's brief that was really uh, interesting for us was rather than getting a list of apartment types based on size and number of bedrooms, we got seven, um, seven typologies of households. And that uh, kind of inspired us to think about how we, they should be organized within buildings. And they should be organized within buildings in a way that allows uh, people to mix and live together and adjacent to each other and start to kind of create that uh, supportive community space. Of course, that's not the only thing that makes community. There's also amenity. And when you're thinking about apartment buildings with 35 to 40 um, dwellings, uh, we think it's important that with even within that small community and within that building, there should be um, recreational spaces incorporated into that. So around this uh, kind of vertical infrastructure of stairs and rises, we're also inserting um, gardens and um, outdoor space and barbecue space and community rooms and things that can help support and foster the community. And that, I, that diagram kind of wasn't that smooth of a transition, but it did translate into what this, how we designed the building. So this um, kind of row of apartments that sit on, on bars and they're accessed from a um, kind of an external, let's say, elevated street. And these connect to a central core. And that's where there's all the kind of additional amenities. So it starts to kind of think about the street and the plaza or the kind of that um, central community space. And that kind of breaking down the building into that kit of parts of apartment bar and core um, meant that we could kind of explore different configurations of building. It gave us a lot of flexibility and freedom. And we found that. Um, this L-shaped configuration and creating these courtyards started to kind of add more interest and more layers of between private and public space. So if you think about this porous courtyard, everything that's outside of it is really open to the public and purely um, public in character. And then this central courtyard, which is still connected to public, but it starts to kind of have a more intimate scale. Uh, perhaps the buildings that um, kind of creates it or, or give it its edges, um, those people maybe feel a bit more ownership towards that courtyard. And then you have the final kind of smaller scale of, of community, which is in the building core, which I just spoke about. And then um, the third part of construction. And during the competition, we did a lot of research into what is, you know, how little embodied carbon could we use uh, looking into masonry and, and timber, but also kind of looking at everything in the context of Canberra and Australia. Um, and in the end, we found that at the time and still now, the most um, kind of sustainable options for this project are looking into rammed earth and looking into geopolymer concrete. Um, I think it's also something that we are aware of or maybe um, would going through ongoing research and iterations and as um, uh, supply chains change and as um, there's more progress in, in the construction industry, perhaps um, later buildings will be built with, with other materials. I think what we're trying to do is ensure that we are confident that we can deliver something that is sustainable at the end. Um, and the other side of construction is not only about kind of where materials are coming from and how they're built, but also are we building appropriately to the climate? And in Canberra, 
uh, we can use the thermal mass of the rammed earth and the concrete to help um, keep the buildings at a more or less stable temperature during the day and night when there's big temperature drops. Um, and the other aspect of that, which is quite in, was quite interesting to us on this project, was also thinking about how we could engage with local um, local manufacturers or companies to think about kind of almost starting something new with this project that maybe can um, kind of set up and have its own life after that. So now I will go through a bit about, uh, in a bit more detail about the master plan. Uh, we always start setting out the strategies. Um, so the first two, the intensification of wetland and regeneration of landscape, I've touched on already, but I'll explain a bit more. So this hydrological idea is about prioritizing um, or giving as much area to deep soil as possible. That means that water, that rainfall that uh, falls on the site is filtered through the plants and, and layers of earth and then um, slowly released into the wetland. And that's really important for the wetland. And kind of adding a layer on to that thing about how the buildings can contribute to that and kind of sustaining the water bodies of the wetland is really important. Um, regeneration of landscape, thinking about how we can um, regenerate the existing soil mount so that it can support native plants and can stop being this more of a contaminant as it that it is at the moment. Um, but then we're also doing a residential neighborhood. So access and connectivity are really important. Um, but we wanted to prioritize that this access and this connectivity works well with landscape and is prioritizing pedestrian access. So any vehicle and service access is kept to the perimeter of the site. Um, but in spite of this, we have good connectivity within the, within the site and with the wider um, Dairy Road neighborhood. Um, then um, these courtyard clusters that I described, um, we kind of found the right arrangement that could ensure that every building kind of belonged to a courtyard and that, that scale of um, outdoor space was something that every, every building um, had access to. And the final part is really about building orientation. So this very simple kit of parts building that we have uh, means that the apartment bar always has a kind of an entrance side and a dwelling side. And to maximize um, the dwelling's access to direct sunlight uh, meant that the, dwell the entrances are always on the south side. And that starts to also create some interesting conditions on the site where even though there's a lot of repetition, this alternating alternation of entrances on a courtyard, on a public space, um, adds that variety and that uniqueness to each building. Okay, so how did we deal with the spoil and what are we going to do to manage this massive uh, volume of earth that we cannot uh, really build on? So, We've um, we designed the building so that they could have very contained, uh, let's say, basements. And this basement level is really just the height of the building that would be required to uh, kind of to sit on the natural topsoil, um, which would be enough for the foundations to be quite shallow. So removing the spoil to allow these basements to sit and for the buildings to sit on natural ground level. So that's the area in, in gray. And that, uh, um, that material that's being excavated is being used to fill up other courtyards so that we start to create a more even um, ground condition. So there's a lower ground condition where the buildings kind of sit in between, um, in between earth and kind of this open edge uh, to the north and south and then a ground level that's kind of more um, holistic and every every courtyard sits on the same level so i can go into the into the master plan plans now so before i do i just want to kind of mention that one of the successes and one of the things that went uh, a lot of energy went into it with uh, discussions with the client 
So about what is the right um, what is the right density for the site? I don't know how many of you know Canberra. I wasn't that familiar with it until I um, started working on the project, but it's not that much of a dense city. Um, and then on top of that, this uh, site is on the periphery of that and it's next to a nature reserve. So when, the brief, when we received the brief, the density that was being requested was more akin to a European type city, so quite dense. Um, but in the context that we're in, the adjacency to the wetland, this idea that we want to prioritize natural or outdoor space and plants and, and landscape, and ensure that every dwelling gets the minimum of three hours direct sunlight and has good um, airflow and sky views meant that we reduced the yields quite significantly. And this is where the scheme currently sits and how it's gone to planning. And it's something that with the client we were quite proud of and pleased that we've managed to achieve. And I think the, the idea of context is really important and understanding what is sustainable is going to vary with each context. And in this case, it was important that the density was something that was managed understanding where we were building. This is um, the ground floor plan. And it shows kind of how this, um, this continuous landscape really merged with the buildings and in, infiltrated around entrances and courtyard spaces. Um, and this is a bit of a diagrammatic plan trying to explain what this great landscape gradient is going to look like. It's obviously, we haven't built anything yet, so there's no photos to show, but the idea is that from this open wetland space that's kind of more grassy and meadowy in character, as you get into and in between buildings, that landscape changes into something that's more wooded and more foresty in nature. Um, access and connectivity, so we needed to ensure that um, there was universal access across the site and not every building had that, and those are the main routes um, through cutting um, east-west and also connecting north and south, um, and those are incorporated in the landscape um, and designing the right levels and ensuring that um, they can be comfortable to use. But then there's this kind of secondary network of like small parts and interconnectivity between and around buildings. And so you can think about this as a network of direct routes and indirect routes and leisurely walks and other things. So it becomes quite rich in character. And um, what I spoke about earlier about this kind of idea of not allowing any vehicles to come into the site, but keeping everything peripheral. So every building has a street frontage on, on this kind of ring road. Um, and that means that they have um, their car park, there's access, car park access from the street, there's service vehicle access from the street, and everything is kind of kept quite peripheral, which means we don't um, compromise any of the deep root soil within the landscape. Um, these are the undercroft spaces, so these kind of semi-basement, semi-not basement um, spaces that are sitting within the earth. And on the north, uh, north portion, we took out some of the car park and replaced that with, um, with commercial shops. So that starts to create a nice street edge with the north of the um, industrious neighborhood. And part of the idea that made us want to ensure that these car parks or basement spaces are never really fully underground is that in the future when perhaps we have less cars, um, more of these um, basement spaces can actually be used for other activities that are maybe more community um, community led or have a community aspect because all of these spaces have that access to natural daylight and uh, natural ventilation. So keeping all the infrastructure on the street level means that the kind of the upper ground floor level is really where uh, we prioritize landscape and this is where um, apartments um, kind of start to interact and sit within this setting. 
Um, just a typical floor. So you might remember that diagram with all the different types of, of apartments and dwellings that came out of the client brief. And that idea of being able to mix and change things around was really important to us. And the way we implemented it was to think about a modular approach to, a part, to the apartment um, design. Um, so working within a structural grid so every build, every apartment sits within a structural grid or half of that. And that means that we can play with the, we could kind of explore the, the size of buildings and make sure we were keeping everything within the 35, 40 um, dwelling um, um, numbers. And then as um, this would be a stage development. So as thing, as buildings get built, then um, we can review whether the apartment mix needs, needs to be changed because of changes in demographics or changes in the market, or perhaps uh, in a few generations, there need to be some adjustments to the apartment types. The building can kind of um, absorb that and, and allow that to happen without uh, too much, uh, too, too many changes, let's say. And maybe the final part of this master plan overview is really how we use but we see the buildings as being able to, to hold landscape and be part of that ideological idea and that community um, providing out of space for community. So there's a few um, plant spaces on the roofs that we've kind of tugged away, but that means that we're able to free the roofs for um, these community um, rooftop gardens and um, solar green roofs, which um, allow for all the rainfall that falls on the buildings to be kind of captured and filtered and then um, managed in, in the right way. And so there's this, this constant duality of uh, sustainability and ecology and also providing amenities for the neighborhood, for, for the people who, li who live here. So I'll talk a little bit about the apartment buildings in a little bit more detail. So this is the arrangement of of the tip of let's say a typical courtyard cluster and you see how all these orange um, bars are representing round earth structure around the load bearing facade so round earth is really um it's, it's, it works well in compression so it's great for taking vertical load so we could use it for let's say these large columns or load bearing walls. It's not so great in tension. So for slabs, we needed to think about something else, which is where we introduced the idea of concrete and geopolymer concrete means that we're able to use something that has lower, lower embodied carbon than conventional concrete, but it also serves the purpose of providing this very durable base that allows us to have outdoor spaces and indoor spaces adjacent to each other without worrying about um, the durability of these outdoor gardens and outdoor spaces that we're producing. Um, and the, another thing to note is, for example, how we've kept the party walls lightweight, which allows for that future flexibility to happen. Um, and you'll see that idea that I mentioned about the core being that central node with circulation and then from there, kind of branches off into these open walkways or we call them elevated streets. Um, and this is a typical plan. So you'll see the variety of apartments and each one gets a north facing aspect. We're in Australia, so north is where we get direct sunlight and that's where um, each apartment gets a private balcony that can support planters, that can support outdoor activities, but then that is supplemented with an oversized core that allows extra outdoor space on your own doorstep, let's say, and um, adding community meeting rooms or spaces for people to dry their laundry and things like that. So it becomes quite um, engaging. And the way we're designing these spaces is kind of putting in the minimal infrastructure that's required so that um, people who live here can really take ownership of those spaces and shape them as they need. And then moving into kind of the apartment or the apartment diagram. And we, we did a bit of work trying to find the right balance or understand how, trying to find a template for um, 
of infrastructure and of structure that could be adapted to the different apartment typologies that we, um, we were providing. Uh, and this is kind of the end result. So we're really using structure to help uh, define the space besides support the building. So you see on the edge, we have on the two edges, there's always um, these round earth columns. So on the north, they're perpendicular so that you create that separation between private balconies. And on the south, they're uh, parallel, so you get that through root. And then the central load bearing round earth wall and the load bearing facade on, the, oh, sorry, self supporting facade on the north and south. And these elements really shape the plan. So um, from the south, you have the apartment entrance and the apartment is kind of split into two zones, the more quiet, uh, intimate entry zone on the south and then the daytime living room, living space on the north that's connected to the private balcony. And the utilities are kind of arranged around this um, central load bearing wall. Um, and that's where we have kitchens and bathrooms and their location can be, um, it, it can be adjusted, but it's always connected to the central wall. So you always get that kind of clear division of space and there's always two care zones in an apartment. Um, I won't go into detail, but that's kind of that diagram. You'll be able to kind of overlay it over each uh, each type of apartment and dwelling, um, and just see how that allowed us to um, create some consistency with the infrastructure and uh, services coordination and structural design, but also give that um, that variation that the client was looking for in the offering of apartments. So. We go from a studio flat to a three-level uh, dwelling, and and everything kind of follows the same logic. And the last part, um, I'll talk about the structure and construction. Um, so you heard from Samantha that we did a lot of research into Ramda, and it's still ongoing. And that research is really kind of um, happening in two parallel streams. Um, that are that keep communicating together. So the first stream um, is that the client and um, the local engineer were really proactive in finding the right collaborator for this project. So um, a precast concrete, um, a young uh, precast concrete manufacturer is kind of very interested in exploring and diversifying. Um, their offering and looking at um, sustain ways of building with sustainable materials. And so they've been a partner with us to kind of figure out how we're going to prefabricate these um, round earth um, structures. And um, there's research going into the modularity of these and um, how big can we, uh, how big of, of piece can we cast in one go and what it, how can we crane it and then thinking about production process. Um, so this was an early test that we did and you see that experimentation. So they were trying different mixes, they got different people to ram to see what, whether that you would notice the change in pattern. So there's quite a lot of work that's going on and um, we're currently looking into ways of um, kind of adding a bit more mechanization into this so that the ramming is not a manual task, which is a, a quite intensive and for a project of this size, probably um, not that sustainable for the people working on it. So th there's a lot of work that goes on in the background. And the second part is, uh, or the second stream of research is with the University of New South Wales in Canberra. Um, so in the pure sense of the word, round earth is just sorted earth that's um, compre or compressed into load bearing structures. And there's a lot of this that happens in Europe um, and it's picking up momentum. In Australia, it's slightly different. So in Australia, they because of um, building approval um, bureaucracies, but also um, a bit of commercial um, challenges, they don't really do round earth and the default when they do is to add cement to it. That's the current um, current situation. And that actually is 
more carbon heavy than if you just build something in, in reinforced concrete. So the challenge we're facing and, and the, what we're trying to kind of work with the universities to find the right additive that we can add to the, to the earth that will help stabilize it and that will help us get things past approvals. It will give the client and the engineer kind of reassurance that across this scale of project, we can get some consistency um, with the structural performance of the rammed earth because we're, we're building a very big site. Um, the, the excavated or, or the spoil is going to have so many variations and inconsistencies because of its nature. So for, with the University of New South Wales, trying to find the right additive that can give us the strength that we need um, to give everyone reassurance, but also manage the embodied carbon. So finding something that is less um, carbon heavy than if we needed to add cement or lime to the mix. And that's where um, their work is getting, uh, is really critical. And what's exciting is that in a way, our project is fueling this research, but we know that this is going to be something that's going to have a much broader scope um, than, than the day road. And the last thing, if I have a little bit of time left, I will, um, so this is, I think my favorite detail of the project. So we have a lot of different facade details. And I think this one um, encapsulates those three principles that I talked about, con um, ecology, construction, and community that we've kind of tried to keep across all the scales. And with this facade detail, this is a balcony detail. So you'll see how we designed the slab edge so that um, when it's when it becomes the external slab, it kind of steps down and we have a raised floor. And that means that that raised floor can be swapped with a shallow tray planter. And you can start to kind of bring in that landscape, that planting into your apartment or onto your footstep and it becomes integral to your dwelling. Um, and then, um, of course, the private dwelling, that idea of um, a personal piece of outdoor space and that access to daylight and cross ventilation. And then the round earth. And one of the things that we're getting our heads around and we'll be uh, starting prototyping soon is about how do we build this building that will have cast in situ um, concrete slabs and then precast round earth and how does all, how do all these things come together? So it's an ongoing process. Uh, we've reached a few milestones which are encouraging and keep us going. Um, and yeah, I hope it was a good talk and I'm looking forward to a bit of a discussion. So thank you. Thank you, Rochelle. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, that was just amazing uh, an amazing journey um from the most sort of uh, i suppose abstract diagram through to absolute reality well almost almost um, yeah <laughs> so i uh, thank you so much for guiding us through it so carefully um let me see another a, a couple of questions have come in so I am inclined to to kick off with those and then see where that takes us sometimes it opens up a floodgate of more so we'll see but they're very much um around the earth particularly i have a, a question of my own but i will come back to it so first of all um ashita asks what was the composition of the rammed earth how much cement was used was it structurally used structurally as load bearing walls i think you've answered some of that but maybe yeah so we we will not be using cement um, and we haven't got to the final mix yet because that's part of the research that the university is doing. But we have this commitment to sustainability and let's use a concrete frame building as the benchmark, which is not a great benchmark, but let's use that. We need to make sure that um, these buildings sit below that in terms of the um, carbon that they embody. So there's a lot of work that needs to go in because this is a new, let's say if it's stabilized round earth with a new type of additive, it's a new material. 
Um, and we know that the scale and the nature of this project, there's, it's too early on in, in our journey as, um, let's say, where we are at now with buildings. It's not just DCA, it's like, it's the wider community. Um, we need to make these milestones and we need to make sure that one milestone leads to the other. But I don't have a qu an answer to that question because we don't have the mix yet, but we're definitely looking to avoid cement and minimize the embodied carbon as much as possible. That's great. Thank you. And I guess um, following on from that, I mean, it's a, it's quite, a, it's one thing to be working on a project timeline, let alone adding in that degree of kind of experimental research um, into the mix, literally, quite literally. How does that work for your project timelines? Yeah, so there's, well, every project has a lot of different factors that affect timeline and um, we use those windows to kind of push research so that's something that's going on at the moment and um, we're looking to start um, start prototyping sometime early next year so we've got a bit of a breather now um, that we're using to kind of push these things forward but you kind of have to be a bit agile because no matter how well you think you're planning, there's always going to be unexpected things that happen. And I think as a design team and with the client, we're just very aware of this. And so mm -hmm. we just, yeah, we stay agile and, and we find the right moments to pursue things. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that the client is fantastically open-minded also. I mean, what an amazing client. Yeah. How, how did that come, come about? Is that a, is that a, is that another long, long timeline of its own? Is that something, a kind of project that's been in the... Well, they came... It, for them, it's been in the pipeline for a long time. Um, like I said, uh, it came to us as a competition in 2021. Um, and they gave us a very ambitious brief and we totally um, embraced it. And, and after that, it was a bit of a push-pull and lots of discussions but in the end we all started from the same place and we were all wanting to go um, reach the same target so um it's been very good very interesting we had debates of our density we had debates about our dearth and um its associated risks and we're we're still we think we're still on the right track so that's that's been very uh, exciting for us and for the client yeah yeah, I can imagine. I mean, I guess uh, there is another question. I'll come to it in one second. But I guess that it, you touched on it, um, given it's, that it's the business we're all in. What are, what are, would you say, the kind of most profound associated risks with rammed earth? Because, again, it's sort of uh, we're at that point in time where it feels like it's the it's the magic solution to lots of our problems. I mean, there are many, I think. Uh, in Switzerland, they do it really well, and it sounds like it's really successful. It takes a lot of skill and a lot of um, a lot of preparation. The material needs to be sorted, um, and they've built up a whole industry around that. And and they're where they are at because they they started from somewhere and they're in a good place now. I think with Australia, we kind of feel like we're starting a bit from zero again. Um, and I think the associated risks with this project is that the scale of it is huge. Like, you know, building one round earth house, you're building 12 four-story buildings. Um, and that means that you need to have quite a lot of consistency, which is, well, it's not challenging, but there's a risk there. Um, and one of the things that the client is also aware of is that they're building for each, each building it has around 35 to 40 apartments and you need to get everyone to buy into this idea and to love the material and um, it can be dusty or you know you, we need to be very thoughtful about how we detail it so um, it doesn't come into contact with water and doesn't uh, erode so there's so many things yeah. and I think part of it is a bit that it's it's a bit of an unknown for a lot of people. And I think the more we get familiar with it, the more confidence people will have and the more advancements it can make as well as a, as a material option. Yeah. 
I don't think it's always going to be the viable option. It takes up a lot of space as well. It's you need mass for it to work. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Um, yes, I wondered about that in terms of how it. What's the relationship between the material using that material and the pl- and the impact it has on the plan? And I guess this links in with density as well. Mm-hmm. But that. Um, it seems to have informed the plan hugely. And I just wonder whether you could say a little bit more about that. Yeah, so we did, we were a bit stubborn and a bit naive that these were going to be round earth buildings. So we did um, we did start with plans that had um, eight, 80 centimeter thick walls and we really wanted to make it work. Um, there's been a process of efficiency and of course the stabilizer uh, that we you know we are we are working on the assumption that the ram death will be stabilized and so that will give us some space efficiencies too um but we also kind of we're quite well, try to be clever with where we put it so it's in external spaces mostly and it internally is kind of contained within one wall and we can use that to um organize space and do other things so yeah, you get. I guess you need to you need to design for it. You can't add it in later. It won't work. Yeah, anyway. yeah. No, really good. Okay, we've got a flurry of questions, so I'm going to go straight to them in our last five or six minutes. Um, what type of foundations are used? You talked to um, them. They will use a mix of piling and pad foundations, depending on where the site sits on the geotechnical report. I'm afraid I can't, I don't know more about that, but um, and they, they will need to be in concrete. So, but that, I mean, that's a given. We need to ensure that they are durable and built well. So, yeah. Great. Right okay. There are a couple of very specific round earth. Um, questions and then I'll come back to one about uh, compressed earth blocks. How long does rammed earth last? That's something that needs to be found out. So actually it can last for quite a long time. Um, It's kind of this duality. We talk about rammed earth but if we are doing something with a special mix then we are going to need to find out what it is. But real rammed earth, so just no additives, just um, earth can last uh, for decades, uh, because there's a bit of an erosion layer, um, and once that that's gone, then kind of the the, the structures is quite stable and quite kind of um, protected from more erosion. Okay, and is is round earth expensive? Expensive abroad. <laughs> we, we won't have any material costs because the material is already there. Um, I think what's expensive is the research that's going behind it, but this is something that's going to serve. So, and then I think, like I said, it's the scale of the project and thinking about how these prefabricated elements are going to be produced at scale is something that requires a bit of investment. Yeah. Um, but so, it's it. We are within budget, and we are still aiming to. Yeah. So yeah. everything has has a give and take, but um, yeah. there are many advantages to the ram earth, and one of them is that we are minimizing the waste that is leaving the site, and we're actually using something that's already on our site that's useful. Yeah. Right. So that equation is is just a different kind. Yeah. It's minus the raw material itself. Mm-hmm. All the other parts of the process. Um, Ross says, really beautiful project. Very encouraging to see research with prefabricated rammed earth. Was compre- were compressed earth blocks ever considered as an alternative to rammed earth panels? So we are going with the rammed earth panels. Um, we well, the engineers kind of saying that we get more. Um, there's more structural integrity if the things are one piece. Um, so in a way, there's a little bit more structural efficiency. And if we are kind of um, producing these, let's say, monolithic blocks, then insulate or construction will be much faster. So it's really related more to that. Um, right. That's so interesting. So it's about, it, it's again, related to the prefabrication element. Mm-hmm. rather. Than, yeah, okay. 
Um, thank you. That's really great. Okay, so there's one more here from JP who says, "Will will we be seeing more projects with Rammed Earth, and if so, in the UK?" Question mark. Well, I hope so. Um, but I know that there's a house that's been built in the UK, and there's a few things that are going on. So it's slowly emerging. It's actually a very old material um, that's that was forgotten for a long time because, yes, concrete was the new thing and steel. Yeah. I mean, I suppose that's what's remarkable about this project is, is the scale of it, isn't it? I mean, we're quite... I would say more familiar with seeing single dwellings or um, mm -hmm. really more more modest uh, constructions, perhaps, um, and also very related to particular contexts. But the idea of bringing that construction technique and material into more sort of urban mm -hmm. projects, and you know, of, of this scale that, it, and and also of of story height. Is is really a kind of um, pioneering part, uh, you know, for an incredible part of the project. Is it, I mean, would it would it be possible to go higher? Do you think is that part of the experiment? Do you think, or is that? Uh, we did well. Like when I was talking about the yields and and what we were allowed to build and what we actually wanted to build, the the story, the height limit on the on the site is eight stories. And when we started talking about rammed earth with the engineer, we were looking at okay, could we take it up six stories? Would it still work? And six seemed to be like the comfortable limit. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's all it's all research and development, so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But obviously, the, the taller you go, the larger the the um, the elements need to be. So as you go up a building, the elements can get more slender, mm -hmm. and vice versa. If you're adding more floors, then the elements at the lower floors need to kind of bulk up to be able to absorb the load. A bit like Gothic architectural masonry, where you kind of start with a heavy base and, um, and it goes further. Yes, it becomes yeah. more slender. So ultimately, we'll be looking at a whole other kind of evolution of ornamentation and other yeah. small arrangements, which is very exciting. That the uh, prospect, I must say. Well, look, we are draw we are drawing to a close. Um, two o'clock is fast approaching, so. I um unless there are any last last minute uh, questions I think I will conclude there Rochelle thank you so much for a really fascinating talk um I uh oh hang on one more has very quickly come in I knew it would because there's a minute I am the JP is asking another question tight shared corridors and thick rammed earth columns seem a little less appealing what are your thoughts on it uh, tight shed corridors. So the corridors are 1.8 meters wide and they are open to one side, so they will feel more spacious. And uh, we thought it was it was okay. Um, it works with code, with um, wheelchair access, and all of that. Um, they could be more generous. We are balancing. Um, areas and internal areas with circulation and it's an ongoing project but it yeah it's the trade-off we, it, we think it works yeah um interesting okay well that's one to leave out there we can debate that um that that balance thank you so much again it was really a fantastic talk um Audience out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I hope you enjoyed your lunch this week. We've got next week, I have to say, I am on the other side of the table. Um, I will be um, welcoming, uh, for a first for Thursday Talks, I will be welcoming someone from outside of our practice network, um, a Jan Nauter from Studio Nauter in Rotterdam, um, who I had the pleasure of working with several years back on an exhibition of the work of Cedric Price, um, Cedric Price's work has influenced Jan's approach um, as a young architect uh, out there in the world. 
And so we're going to talk a little bit about that and actually um, talk about two projects that Jan is currently doing, which are really around circular economy in the Netherlands, um, uh, starting off as a kind of a single building provocation and turning into something much bigger. So um, really looking forward to that. Uh, look forward to seeing you all next week and hopefully tell all your friends to join us too. That would be good. And uh, thanks again, Rochelle. I hope we see you soon and welcome um, can welcome you here to the yeah. LSA, to our well, Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And thanks for the questions as well. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Nice Bye. to see you. Okay. Cheerio. Thank you very much. Bye.